Hi, I'm Zor. Welcome to Unizor Education. Um, today I would like to start a new chapter in this course. The course is Physics for Teens, presented on Unizor.com, and the new chapter is about alternating current. Uh, I do recommend you to watch this lecture from the website from Unizor.com because the lecture, every lecture, has a textual part, notes, and this is basically like a textbook. So you have the present video presentation and the textbook which basically accompanies this so you can always you know read it again and check whatever you have missed maybe um, the site is free by the way and uh, also there is a prerequisite course called math for teens which is absolutely necessary for learning physics I mean not necessarily that particular course but math in general is necessary for um, understanding what's going on with physics. Okay, alternate current. Now, alternating current is what we are using at home usually and what's uh, used in uh, plants, industrial uh, facilities, etc. Now, um, first of all, let me just tell you right up front that alternating current is not the same as direct current. Direct current is when you have a constant flow of electrons in one direction with the same intensity so to speak so the current itself which usually is um, denoted with the letter i um, is constant alternating current is well it's alternating it's alternating in the uh, magnitude and direction and it seems to me that this actually is more, it's a simpler, right? So why do we have to bother with alternating current? Well, let me start with mentioning, it was a movie. Uh, I think it's called ACDC or something like this. It's basically uh, two different technologies based on direct current and based on alternating current with two very important uh, scientists and inventors, Edison on the direct current side and Tesla and Westinghouse on the alternating current side. They were actually competing um, in the United States for um, putting the electricity into the homes. And uh, so considering such an important figure as Edison was proponent of the direct current, uh, it's not you know, so simple to, to say, okay, this is definitely better than that. No, it's not that simple. However, alternating current is still more convenient, and that's what I'm going to talk about right now. Okay. First of all, why is it more convenient from a um, theoretical standpoint? Um, now, you know that uh, direct current produces magnetic field around it, right? So if you have a um, some kind of a conductor, a wire, and there is a direct current in it, then there is a magnetic field around it. Or if you will put it in a loop, for instance, and this is the better. So you have a direct current constant flow of electrons then you have magnetic field around it so it actually acts as a permanent magnet with a north and south pole which are perpendicular to the um, area of the loop so we know that so we know how to convert electricity into magnetic field what alternating current does it produces the variable magnetic field, right? Since we are changing the current, direction, magnitude, whatever, there is a change. There is a change in flux, magnetic flux, and change in magnetic flux can generate electricity somewhere else. That's it called induction. You remember the Faraday's law, etc. So what's important about alternating current is not only it can produce a magnetic field, but it can produce magnetic field which can produce electricity again using the induction. So that's very important because by changing 
from electricity to magnetism, from magnetism back to electricity, from electricity back to magnetism, etc. We can actually change certain parameters, and I will talk about which ones. And at any point, we can um, connect some kind of a consumer, which is the most convenient for that particular voltage and amperage or whatever else. So, let me start from the beginning. How do we generate electricity? Well, we have to generate it, right? So we have power plants. Power plants usually, we are not talking about solar uh, power plants, we are, which, which, which are important and they do produce electricity, but it's a direct electricity and it's a relatively low in power. The most powerful power plants are based on transforming mechanical movement. It, it might be the falling water in hydroelectric station or it can be steam uh, in, in uh, nuclear uh, station produced by the heat. So we are transforming some other energy sources like heat or mechanical movement into electricity. And basically the mechanical movement at the very end is the most important part. How did we do it? Well, again, this is based on magnetic induction. What we usually do is, well, the simplest um, movement which we can really use in, in our practical life is rotation, right? So if you have a rotating frame, and it's rotating around this axis, and you have some kind of a magnetic field here, uniform magnetic field. So what happens with, uh, with this uh, wireframe? Well, as we know, we have uh, the magnetic flux, which is equal to uh, intensity of the magnetic field B times the area through which this magnetic field is uh, flowing. But since my area is changing, in this particular case, area is zero, right? Because magnetic um, field lines are going, they're not really crossing the area. But if it turns, then magnetic field will actually go through the frame. And if it's a perpendicular in this position, the whole area of the uh, wireframe will be crossed. So this is variable. Now, how is this variable? Well, if S is the real frame, then you have to multiply it by, let's say, cosine of W, omega T, where omega is angular, angular speed, right? It's very easy to, to, uh, to understand. Um, at T is equal to zero, uh, well, it's probably better to have sine here. It all depends on the angle. So my position is, if my position is this, initial position, at t is equal to zero, then we have to put sine here, because sine of zero is zero, so that's why you have zero. But if um, uh, omega times t, if angle is 90 degrees, then the sine would be equal to one, and you have the full uh, area um, to, be f uh, to, uh, to, to go through for magnetic field. So this is magnetic flux. And we know that the generated EMF, electromotive force, well, actually the voltage in this case would be also depending on time, minus derivative of the flux, which is equal to B S um, cosine and omega, omega cosine omega T. So, this is variable. So as we are turning, rotating our frame, and that's exactly how electricity is produced by the power plant. They use whatever the mechanics are to rotate certain frame uh, in the magnetic field. Or, which is more practical actually, they rotate magnetic field uh, around the frame or inside the frame. doesn't really matter. I mean, how do we arrange it? The most important is 
that the magnetic flux is changing. So some, something is supposed to be rotating relative to something else. Field, source of the magnetic field relative to the uh, permanently positioned frame or frame in the magnetic field, doesn't matter. The result will be the same. It will be variable flux, variable flux generates my EMF. And EMF can be used as a voltage if you connect consumers to this. So, this looks like it's easier to, from, from purely practical purposes, from engineering standpoint, it's easier to produce alternating current. Now, alternating, you see, it's a cosine. So, you have a sinusoidal uh, graph of uh, uh, voltage produced. Uh, it has certain maximum, which is equal to B times S times omega. Uh, minimum is minus B S omega and it's pulsating in between these from U max to minus U max uh, in, in a sinusoidal way. Now, obviously since we have the Ohm's law the form, the shape of electric current will be exactly the same variable sinusoidal. Now again, the fact that this is a cosine or sine, it doesn't really matter, it all depends on how do we start the initial moment t, at the moment when the frame is this way or the frame is this way. So the most important is the character. The character of a sine and the character of a cosine are exactly the same, just shift in time by half a period. Okay, so we have concluded that generation of um, electricity is easier uh, when we are generating the alternating current. So, again, this is sinusoidally changing electric current is called alternating. So, if you will measure the electric current in, uh, let's say, outlet at your home, if you will be able to uh, connect, let's say, a scope or something, some device which will show you exactly um, the, uh, the flow of electrons, if you wish, um, then you will see exactly the graph like this. The sinusoid. So, to generate is easier, it's simpler. Can we generate direct, cu uh, direct current? Well, we can, but it's much more difficult, mechanically speaking. From the, from the position, let's say, uh, of uh, battery, for instance, the chemical um, uh, energy converted into electricity, actually it's a direct current in this particular case. But mechanically speaking, when you have really a rotation as the source of mechanical energy, um, you, you cannot avoid this. I mean, engineering-wise, this is the easiest solution, and that's exactly why AC is dominating the um, power. I mean, what, what do you have for direct current? Very few things, well, obviously, remote control on TV, you have whatever the battery operated. Um, well, you have cars, there is a direct current in the car because there is a battery, and the battery produces, let's say, 12 volts constant um, electricity. But in real uh, um, industrial capacity, we are using alternating current. And again, my number one reason is it's easier to generate using the mechanical source, not chemical, mechanical source of energy um, to produce uh, electricity using induction. So that's the main method. Another advantage goes step further. Now, what do we do with electricity? Well, you have a power plant but you don't have it in every apartment or every building uh, or whatever else. We have some centralized power plants and we have to transport electricity from the power plant to consumers. So, um, now let's think about it. How do you do it? Well, you just, this is the power plant and this is the consumer. Well, you have wires. Sometimes wires are miles and miles and kilometers and kilometers long 
and uh, they have some resistance, electrical resistance. How do we reduce loss of electricity due to resistance? I mean, you know, we have a drop of the voltage, right? So if you have some voltage here, and then you have a very, very long wire, which has certain resistance, the voltage here will be less. There is a voltage drop. Now, there is a voltage drop, and there is a basically loss in in the power. So, if you remember, there is a amount of heat produced by um, electricity, which depends on the resistance. So, basically, the power consumed by resistor R is this. I is the current, and the R is the resistance. So we know that from, from the previous part where we were talking about electricity. So we are losing every second. This is the power consumption. Obviously the energy will be my times t, where the time, t is the time, uh, which we are losing. But per second we are losing this. So how can we reduce these? I mean, this is just complete waste. I mean, why do we have to heat up our wires? There is no need for this, right? Well, we can reduce R, or we can reduce I, the current. But well, reduce R is kind of questionable. I mean, how can you reduce R? You, you, you can increase the, the diameter of the, um, of the wire. Well, it will reduce uh, resistance, but it will tremendously increase the price and weight and stuff like this. So, not an option. So, you have to somehow reduce I. So, if you have developed certain power, electric power, here, what's the power which you are actually producing? Well, that's this. Voltage times current. And it's variable, because this is variable. <coughs> now, now you have to transfer it over there, without losing power basically or with a, as small loss of power as possible well the power is produced but maybe we can change the same amount of power by increasing voltage and decreasing current the um, result of multiplication will be the same let's say we double the voltage and half the current it will be the same thing but we need this device which will do this type of thing because if we will do this my voltage will be high, my current would be less, and my loss of power would be less, right? So we need a device which would, without loss of power, increase voltage and decrease the current. Okay, so it will be high voltage, lower current, it will be here. Now, this is the consumer. You don't want 6,000 volts coming into the apartment, so now you have to really do inverse operation. You have to reduce the voltage and increase the current to feed all the devices which we have, right? So, we need another device which again does this power transformation, increasing the current and decreasing the voltage. But these devices do exist. These are transformers and they're working also only on the alternating current. Now, we did talk about solenoids, and we did talk about two loops. If one has a variable um, current in it, like alternating, well, any variable, it produces certain variable magnetic field. So, the B, which goes from this, would be variable. Now, if you have this loop nearby, since B is variable, this is just permanently positioned. My flux would be different, and since my flux is different, that would be induced EMF, induced electromotive force. Since the flux is different, the derivative would be greater than zero, or less, not equal to zero, right? And it will produce electric current here. 
So if this is variable, let's say it goes this way and then this way, this way and then this way, my flux would be this or this, this or this, changing sinusoidally is again, and it will produce sinusoidal electric current in this alternating current. So alternating current can be transformed from here to here. Now if you have not just one loop but a solenoid here and here, a lot of different you know uh, loops on the same wire. So every loop will produce whatever the magnetic field actually is and every loop here would consume and it all depends on the number of uh, times this loop actually goes around. So if you have certain number n1 of loops here and n2 here, so this will be proportional to n1, this will be proportional, the result will be proportional to n2 because every loop generates the same thing, right? Every loop here generates the um, uh, uh, variable magnetic field variable magnetic field generates in every loop of these corresponding variable electric uh, alternating current. So it's proportional here and proportional here. So by changing N1 and N2, we, 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 we can actually vary the, um, the current which is generated here relative to here and voltage here versus voltage here. Now we will go through these calculations in another lecture. It's an important um, topic, how transformers are actually arranged. But this is actually how transformers are made. Transformers which can increase the voltage, decreasing the uh, current on this end, or vice versa, uh, decreasing the voltage and increasing the uh, current on the consumer end. So it's all done using transformers and transformers are working only with variable um, electric current. So alternating current not only easier to produce but also easier to transform in the most convenient fashion with less power loss. That's why Edison has lost his war with direct current against Westinghouse and Tesla, which were proponents of the alternating current. Okay, um, what else? Okay, now we have basically concluded this. That we have sinusoidal voltage and sinusoidal um, alternating electric current. And I will just mention some terminology. So you have u as a function of t. It's equal to, it's some kind of a maximum times sine of omega t or cosine of omega t. Sometimes you, but people using this or that and again it doesn't really matter because it all depends on where do we start the the time um, since it goes all the time infinitely left and right you can start now this is the sign and this is cosine so one is just shifted relative to another so it's the same behavior all depends on when do we start our time so, we will use mostly sign, doesn't really matter. And the, the U maximum is, well, basically it all depends on geometry of this wire loop and uh, the magnetic intensity, etc., etc. Doesn't really matter. It's all in the power plant, somehow it's done. There are certain magnets which produce certain uh, magnetic field intensity B. There is a loop which has certain area S and there is a mega which is um, angular speed. So this is something which um, you, you, you probably just you know think about everything. All these details are hidden here but the behavior is here. 
Now, obviously, the current using the Ohm's law would be similar. What is I max? Well, this is U max divided by R, where R is the resistance of the circuit where the whole thing actually is happening. So, whenever you have a, a, a regular, let's say, device, something like a lamp, which you um, connect to electricity um, at home, so you have alternating current going through this lamp. Well, if the current goes one way, then the current goes another way, again this way and that another way, in the sinusoidal, basically, character. Now, um, the U max is called amplitude of the alternating current. What else do we have? Well, we have frequency. Now, what is frequency? Frequency is number of well, this is the period number of periods per second. Well, one period is 2 pi angle, right, in radians. Omega is number of radians per second. So if we want number of um, rotations per second, it's basically omega divided by 2 pi, right? This is number of radians per second. This is one full circle. So if you want to know how many circles per second, you have to divide. Now, the, um, the period is equal to t, it's equal to, well, that's basically 2 pi over omega, right? So if you have so many periods per second, then one period is one second divided by the frequency, which is, I think it's f. <coughs> period is t. So this is just terminology. So you have period, you have frequency. Um, frequency is more often used in regular, you know, conversation about electricity. In United States, the frequency is um, 60 uh, periods per second, or hertz. That's unit. That's number of periods per second. One period per second is one hertz. So the frequency in the United States is 60 uh, hertz. In Europe, it's uh, 50. And um, I don't know about other countries, quite frankly. But probably it's either 50 or 60, depending on which one they, which technology they have adopted. Um, as far as the voltage is, the voltage generated at the station, at the power station, well, I point here because <laughs> I remember I was actually drawing the power station here and consumer there. So on the power station, um, whatever, what, what, whatever the uh, voltage is generated immediately from, um, from the power plant before the first transformation is irrelevant. But after the first transformation, the voltage which is actually transmitted through the wires across, across the continents even, well, that's hundreds of thousands of volts. Now, compare it with the consumer voltage, which is um, in the United States, it's usually 110 to 20. In Europe, it's 220 usually. Um, well, hundreds of thousands versus like 200, 100, 200, whatever. It's a big difference. So first, we are increasing the power uh, increasing the voltage, sorry. Power doesn't change, obviously. We have the energy conservation. So transformer increase the um, voltage and decrease the current to reduce the loss. So the high voltage goes with a very low um, current, and that's why very low losses in between. 
and that high voltage goes to consumers where it actually is reduced to whatever we are having here. And by the way, the whole thing of increasing the voltage and reduction of the voltage is not like instantaneous, it goes in steps. Like from hundreds of thousands, we might have some local um, transformation center, whatever, where it's from hundreds of thousands goes down to thousands, and then from thousands goes, uh, let's say, near every building in the city, you have a small transformer which will transfer from thousands, let's say, to hundreds of volts. And that's what actually goes to apartments. Well, basically, that's it. It was an introductory lecture, very, very small amount of mass here, um, about uh, alternating current and its properties. Now, as far as the properties, again, you have the maximum, you have, uh, which is amplitude, you have the frequency, uh, which are important. Now, the question is, when we are saying there is a 220 volts, what does it mean actually in the outlet? Well, we know that it's changing, right? So it's not like permanent. Is it like amplitude? Is it the maximum? No, it's not. The voltage, which is um, uh, usually the one which is mentioned when we are talking about alternating current, is in some way a mean voltage. I will talk about this in the next lecture. It's actually the voltage which allows the, uh, the corresponding current to produce as much um, heat, let's say, as much power, if you wish, as if corresponding direct voltage and direct current um, would be supplied. So if you have a uh, uh, incandescent lamp. Now, if you connect it to alternating current, it will uh, increase the temperature, the heat will be increasing, and uh, it will start basically um, emitting light, right? So, the electricity, the direct current, which will produce Im about the same amount of light, or amount the, sa the same amount of heat, would be actually the number which is associated with alterna uh, alternating current. So you have alternating current and you have a direct current. So alternating produce some heat and direct produce some kind of heat. So the amount of direct uh, current, the value of direct current, which is producing exactly the same amount of heat as alternating, is actually quoted as the voltage or, or, or amperage of a particular um, uh, device, whatever it's consumed, um, when we are talking about alternating current. So we are not talking about absolute values, but we are talking about effect which alternating current produces with, let's say, la lamp or, or motor or whatever else. Well, that's it. Uh, I do suggest you to read the notes for this lecture. You have to go to unizor.com, choose um, Physics for Teen course, that's electromagnetism, and that's where you will find properties of alternating current. Thank you very much, and good luck. <laughs>